Good morning and welcome to Lincoln Square Synagogue. We have the uh, special pleasure of, uh, of launching the new Rav Kook Koren, uh, new Koren edition Rav Kook Sidur. Uh, we also have the honor of welcoming two uh, real towering scholars. I guess uh, by way of uh, introducing them, I will say that uh, when I was bored in class, when I was in YU, uh, there would be uh, two things that I would read uh, often. The first would be articles and uh, books that were printed on the Orot website written by Rabbi Naor. And the second would be the Svarim vlog, which would be populated by these astounding posts uh, by Professor Shapiro. And we are lucky to have them here, both very fascinating and uh, scholars at the, uh, the cutting edge of what is uh, interesting and what is uh, on people's minds in the Jewish world. And, uh, and uh, together, uh, they will discuss today the launching of Koren's new book, uh, with, uh, that has been produced under the uh, scholarship of Rabbi Naor, uh, which reproduces Rav Kook's insights into the Sidur, uh, culled from his writings, and uh, drawing upon Rabbi Naor's immense expertise in Rav Kook. I would say perhaps, uh, perhaps sitting at this table today are two of the greatest expositors in English of Rav Kook's thought today. I don't think that that's an exaggeration. Um, I would uh, very, uh, I'd be very pleased to mention in the beginning, uh, to mention and to acknowledge the presence of David Stephen Fansky, the inspiration and patron of the Rav Kook Sidur, um, and uh, the presence of Rabbi Yossi Palit, the U.S. representative of Koran Publishers uh, in Jerusalem, and uh, actually the Sidurim are for sale outside. You can be the first to uh, get your hands on a uh, real copy. I have my own. It's quite beautiful. And uh, also in that connection, uh, we want to thank uh, Matthew Miller, CEO of Koren, who certainly deserves honorable mention today at this event. Uh, Professor Mark Shapiro is the Weinberg Chair in Judaic Studies at the University of Scranton. He is the author of numerous books, including Between the Shiva World and Modern Orthodoxy, a biography of the Sri Daesh, Rabbi Echil Yaakov Weinberg. We actually have in our base medrash uh, the collective writings of the Sri Daesh, edited by uh, a person, I believe it's the same person, Melech Shapira, that's you as well, and The Limits of Orthodox Theology, both of which were National Jewish Book Award finalists. His newest book, Changing the Immutable, How Orthodox Judaism Writes His History, appeared in 2015, and it is highly recommended. I loved it. And Rabbi Bitzal Naor is the founder of Orot, a not-for-profit organization to disseminate the teachings of Rav Kook. He's the author of various works of Jewish thought, philosophy, Kabbalah. Uh, it says here Sabbateanism. The truth is it's post-Sabbatean Sabbateanism. It's the title of his book. And his latest works include Machol Sadikim, the controversy between Rabbi Moshe Chaim Litzat and Rabbi Isaac of Omel concerning divine design and creation, and an annotated English translation of Rav Kook's seminal work, Orot, also published by Magid Books under the Koran imprint. Uh, without further ado, they will be in dialogue together with a uh, person who needs no introduction, Armara de Asra, Rabbi Shaul Robinson, and uh, with that, I will uh, stop talking. Well, uh, Warren, thank you. And I want to, we owe a tremendous uh, debt of gratitude to Rabbi Rosenfeld for uh, coordinating, pulling this event together and, uh, and uh, taking care of all of the logistics. And um, a warm welcome to everybody. Uh, I don't need to uh, endorse what you just said, but I want to uh, reiterate how privileged we as a shul are to feel, uh, uh, pr to be able to host this uh, wonderful event. Without further ado, we're going to get right down to it. We as a community, um, for the last uh, 12 or 15 hours since news that a member of our shul had gone missing uh, in very worrying circumstances, found ourselves enwrapped in tefillah. And this morning and morning, in the middle of morning, Minion came the news that the person had been found. And uh, when we discuss a sitter, I want us to really understand that we're not just discussing a um, uh, an academic, an abstract uh, work that belongs in a Jewish bookshelf, but when in good times and in bad times, it's the, uh, the instinct of a Jew to reach for the Siddur and to know that we take, uh, we take refuge, we strengthen ourselves in davening. So this work that we're here to discuss, this incredible work, is not merely a work tremendous intellectual importance of course it's a work of immediate relevance a siddur is something which belongs within hand's reach of every single jew and without further ado i want to open up the dialogue by asking rabbi naor uh, to just tell us a little bit of a background about how this incredible work the new first ever english translation the koran rav kook siddur came into be yeah, well, first of all, I want to thank Rabbi Shaul Robinson. I uh, sent him a message a while ago asking on, on him. On Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> and 
I was amazed this rabbi responded immediately. You know, there aren't a lot of rabbis that respond Don't immediately. Respond to the congregants immediately. <laughs> and uh, it was an immediate yes. And you know, I'm I'm flabbergasted. But thank you. <laughs> How this sidur came about, the the uh, the genesis of the sidur. Well, we have sitting uh, in the audience uh, David Stefanski, a dear friend. And uh, he had a dream. He wanted to see uh, Rav Cook's uh, thoughts on prayer conveyed to a wider audience. And um, I remember we had a, uh, a meeting uh, together with Matthew Miller, who was visiting New York at the time, and we partnered up. Um, and that's how it came about. Now, the Sidor is in memory of another dear friend, uh, Rabban Stefanski, and uh, we have uh, Hani, uh, his, uh, his wife, uh, in the audience here. Um, and, uh, you know, Rav Cook is all about Orot, all about lights, and uh, that's really what we wanted to uh, convey through this Siddur, through this, this vehicle, this medium of the, uh, the prayer book, the, the Orot, the lights of Rav Kook, to, to light up this planet. Um, I also I want to thank uh, our videographer, Morty Gilden. Uh, on the ride down, I found out that he and I have a lot of uh, friends in common. Uh, He's a fellow New Englander, and uh, I hope that we can develop this relationship further. And, and hopefully, Bezrat uh, Hashem, through Morty, we will be able to preserve this historic dialogue for posterity. So for years to come, people will be able to uh, access this resource. And uh, I think that's pretty much the, the introduction. I think from here we can start. Okay. Well, let, let me just uh, add, add a little bit more. The, the Rav Kook wrote a commentary, or became a commentary in the Siddur. Why did you feel it was necessary to bring this to a uh, English-speaking audience, a wider audience? Why the Rav Kook Siddur? Why now? Why is this <coughs> the time? And what is the, the need for it? You know, I've been translating Rav Kook uh, for many years. Um, wrote started back in 1990, so uh, you know it's uh, it's a lifetime. And uh, in the beginning, uh, there were people who questioned whether Ruff Cook would approve of this because the goal is to move all of us to Eretz Israel. You're not able to hear. We don't have a mic. We'll just speak a little. There is a mic, but no, no, that's for the recording. It's for the yeah. no speakers. Sit closer. Yeah. Sit closer. Move up. <laughs> okay, just we'll, we'll just speak. Yeah. So in the beginning of, of this enterprise of translating Rav Cook from Lashon Hakodesh from the sacred tongue out to English and other languages. Uh, there were people who questioned the wisdom of this, whether Rav Cook uh, would approve of this, because the goal is to move all of us to Eretz Yisrael, and that we should all become Hebrew speakers. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as I said, you know, people voiced uh, opposition, and I myself at uh, times questioned the, the validity of what I'm doing. And recently, I was overjoyed uh, to see in a, uh, a manuscript of Rav Cook, which was just released, uh, where Rav Cook is holding up the work of um, Abraham Cohen Herrera, uh, Shar HaShemayim, which was uh, written in Spanish. Uh, it was published in Amsterdam back in the uh, in the 1600s, and uh, it's a work of Kabbalah. And Rav Cook, uh, <coughs> the, the, yeah, Rav Cook is glowing in his praise of this work, a, a Spanish presentation of Kabbalah, because this man Herrera. Um, <coughs> 
is able to get this uh, teaching across to the entire world. And when I saw that, I was very happy because it's like I got a, uh, a haskama from my <laughs> Rebbe. You know, I had uh, approval of, of this enterprise that Rav Cook believes very strongly in translating and in communicating and getting this message out to the entire world. That goes for Jews and non-Jews. Okay, so let me uh, open. First of all, just um, I know nobody likes ever to sit in the front row if they uh, can possibly help it, but there are seats in the front row. Not only that, but there are seats waiting to be uh, unstacked and uh, on this side of the Bet Midrash. So please uh, make yourselves uh, comfortable. It's, uh, we want everybody to feel, uh, to feel at home. Um, a question now for, for, um, for the two of you, and I'm going to really be uh, just merely moderating a discussion. Do you believe that Rav Cook was ahead of his time? We'll start with Rabbi Shapiro, Professor Shapiro. Okay, actually, no, I don't think he was ahead of his time. I think he was exactly where he should have been because if you recall, that was the era when uh, the non-religious were moving to Eretz Israel. They were coming to places, the new settlements. There was a cherem on secular studies in the, the traditional communities. This was also, an, and that obviously couldn't work for the new, new land. These were also people, think of the paradox here. These were people, many of whom were not only non-religious, they were anti-religious, they were atheistic. They saw what they were doing as an opposition to the Torah. And yet, they were not moving to South Africa, they weren't moving to America, they weren't moving to Paris. They weren't, could you relate to them the same way you relate to the Bundists or the assimilationists? Uh, it was obvious that something new was afoot. And Rav Cook was able to sense that these people who in their own mind were far from religion actually saw something that the rabbis did not see, that it was time for Jews to once again re-enter history. You know, Rav Cook writes in Orot, so beautifully translated by Rabbi Noor, you know, that the body is also holy, and we forgot about it. For 1900 years in the exile, we forgot there were a body and a spirit, and the focus was only on the spirit. So these non-religious, maybe even in quotes, non-religious Jews, were bringing us back <coughs> to the era, to the way we're supposed to be, and that's why it was fortunate that Rav Cook was there to recognize this Dafka at that time to provide the philosophy, the justification, and let us see that what was going on was not just a rebellion against Torah and Jewish values, which was appeared from the outside, but that these people had what he termed a segula, something special. That, uh, so he was the one. So if to answer the question, he was at the exact right moment that he needed to be. Yeah, okay. The question is, do you believe that Rav Cook was ahead of his time? Um, something I learned from my Chabad friends in, in Crown Heights, we have to live with the time. So today is the yard site of the Rambam, okay? It's the 20th of Tevet. Uh, also, Rabbi Yaakov, Abir Yaakov, but we're, we're going to focus on the Rambam. So today, the 20th of Tevet is the, the yard site of Maimonides, Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon. And I'm going to try to show some parallels between Rav Kook and the Rambam. But before we do that, um, we're celebrating another anniversary. And, and this is not as famous as the Rambam's yard site. Um, in a few days, it will be the 40th anniversary of my meeting for the first time Rav Tzvi Yehuda HaKohen Cook, who was the, the Ben Yochid, the only son of Rav Cook, and uh, in many ways truly the, the Yoresh HaEtze, the, the heir to that legacy. And uh, you'll be able to figure out soon how old I am. Uh, I was just married, and uh, at the conclusion of the Sheva Brachot, my wife and I made Aliyah, and we arrived in Eretz Yisra. It was the first time I was ever in the land. And uh, it was on Chavdal uh, Tevet, which is the art set of the Alter Rebbe, Rav Shneur Zalman of Liadi. Didn't know that at the time, found out later. And uh, the next night, uh, my wife and I uh, met with Rav Tzviud HaKohen Cook. 
he had never seen me, never laid eyes on me, I had never laid eyes on him. And uh, that meeting really changed my life. And uh, I, I cannot divulge everything that uh, transpired at the meeting, but something very important that he transmitted to me and I'm transmitting to you. So I'm a, a conduit uh, of this teaching. He told me that the same sav, the Hebrew word sav means command, a, a, a command from above, the same command that told his father to write Reshmilin, and I'll explain in a moment what that book is all about. It's a, a mystical work, a Kabbalistic work. The same tzav, the same command that uh, told his father to write that work, also told his father to write the Halacha Brura, which is a halachic work, and uh, which has been referred to as Binyan HaTorah LeDorot, building Torah for generations to come. This tzav took place in London in World War I. Um, it didn't take place in the land, ironically. It took place in London. Rav Cook's student, Rav Chalap, said that there must be a, a tsinor, like an invisible pipeline, from the Kodesh HaKodeshim to Rav Cook's residence in London. <coughs> what is the parallel to the, the Rambam? The Rambam achieved immortality through two books. One is his halachic work, Mishneh Torah, which is Binyana Torah Ledorot. That's the authoritative code of Jewish law to this day. Has never been superannuated, superseded. Nothing can supersede the, the Mishneh Torah of the Rambam. And his other work is a, a work of philosophy, Morah Vuchim, Guide of the Perplexed, because in Judaism, we have this beautiful conversation between the two hemispheres of the brain, between left hemisphere and right hemisphere, which we express as halacha and agadah. There's the, the law and the legends, the law and the lore. And these people, such as the Rambam and, and Rav Kook, who are our teachers for the ages, they excel in both, and they're able to have this beautiful conversation between the two hemispheres of the brain. So in the case of the Rambam, you have his halacha, and then you have his work on nevuah, because in the Perusha Mishnah, he promises he's going to deliver a work of prof prophecy, on prophecy, what happened to it. Uh, the consensus among scholars is that that material is incorporated in Morer Hanavuchim, especially in, in Chelek Bet of, of the Guide of the Perplex, where he, there are several chapters about prophecy. So what are the two hemispheres? They are intellect and imagination. And that's what you're getting in Rav Cook's two works that, again, uh, came to him in London during World War I. It was also uh, a period of extreme stress, both, both globally, it was World War I, but also in Rav Cook's own private life, he was battling cancer. He was battling stomach cancer. And there was some ridiculous uh, placard that came out, uh, Mazel Tov, Rav Cook has been uh, cured of hemorrhoids, uh, which was totally ridiculous. That he wasn't suffering from hemorrhoids. He, had, he was battling stomach cancer, and at that time he survived. Later in 1935, he had uh, a remission of stomach cancer, and unfortunately at that time he did not survive. But those are the two works. The Reish Milin is a, a work of imagination, of mysticism, perhaps even of prophecy. And 
The other work, which goes on to this day, the scholars in Ushlaim to this day work on it. This uh, mifal, this enterprise of halacha brura, and the reason that Rav Tzviuda revealed this to me was he wanted me to work on the halacha brura, which I did not for various reasons. But that's why he revealed to me the importance of that work. He said the same tzav, the same command that told my father to write Reish Milin, told them to write Halacha Brura. And despite that, I uh, <laughs> politely refused the offer. But who is Rav Cook? And uh, what, what is the legacy? The, the man who understood Rav Kook better than anyone else was Rav Yaakov Moshe Chalap. Rav Kook said that when Rav Chalap and he are alone in a room, there's only one human there. There's only one person there. They're not two people. It's one. That's how close they were. And at the, again, at this time of World War I, when Rav Kook was in exile in London and Rav Chalap was left back in Yushlayim, at the, the Kotel, Rav Chalap had a, a vision, and it was revealed to him who his neshama is. He's a reincarnation of certain melech, and Rav Kook is Chizkiyahu. Rav Kook is Chizkiyahu. And this is very important because before Rav Kook's death, Jews around the world prayed for Avram Yitzchak Chizkiyahu. Rav Chalap added the name Chizkiyahu because well, Chizkiyahu means, you know, God should strengthen him, Chazak, but it was more than that because Rav Chalap knew that he's the neshama of Chizkiyahu HaMelech, this uh, king of, uh, of Judah, Melech Yudah. And uh, in fact, a, uh, a letter that uh, Bezalel Stefanski made available to me, I put in one of my works, a letter from the Lubavitcher Rebbe of the time, Rav Yosef Yitzhak Schneerson to Rav Kook, where he says he has the entire Lubavitch Yeshiva in Otvotsk, which is a suburb of Poland, praying for Rav Kook's recovery. But the, the prayers were, for, and the letter is addressed to Avram Yitzchak Chizkiyahu. What is, what is it all about? Who is Chizkiyahu? In order to understand who Chizkiyahu is, you have to take a look in a, a Gemara. It's in Brachot of Kafchen. It says that when Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai was on his deathbed, he said, Achinu kisei l'chizkiyahu melech Yudah Shabbat. And Rashi says, Eli l'lavoti. He's dying, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. He says, bring a chair for Chizkiyahu, the king of Judah, who has come to accompany me to the other world. So what does Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai have to do with Chizkiyahu? There's another Gemara, it's in Perikand Yisokin, in, in uh, Gitin, where Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai is able to get out of besieged Jerusalem, and he meets with Aspasianus, with Vespasian. And he asked for three things, very famous, Ten li Yavne give me Yavne, which became the new seat of the Sanhedrin after Yerushalayim. And Asfata uh, de Rabbi Tzadok, I need doctors to cure Rabbi Tzadok, who had been fasting for 40 years, his stomach shrunk. But uh, number two, Shoshilta de Rabban Gamliel, the, the dynasty of Rabban Gamliel. And Rashi explains why that was so important, because that's the, that's the Davidic dynasty. Rabban Gamliel was a scion of uh, the Davidic dynasty. He was descended from David Melech. And Rabbi Yochanan ben Zaka, again, he's setting up Judaism for the ages, how Judaism will survive after the Churban. So he needs Yavne v'chachamei, he needs a Sanhedrin, but he also he has to preserve the, the Davidic dynasty. And that's why Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, before he dies, he says, Hachinu kisei l'chizkiyahu melech sheba elai l'lavoti. Why chizkiyahu? Because chizkiyahu was one of the last kings of, of Judah. And he's coming to greet me. He has gratitude to me 
because I saved the Davinic dynasty. I saved, Shosh I saved Shoshilta, the Rabbi Gamliel. I saved the, the dynasty of, of David and Mel. So Chizkiyahu, who's one of the last uh, Davidic kings, is coming to greet me. What does it all mean? When Rav Kook moved his embassy from Jaffa to Jerusalem, he takes on now the personality of Chizkiyahu HaMelech. He's no more provincial rabbi of Zemel or Boys or Yafo. He's now the persona of Chizkiyahu HaMelech. After World War I, he comes back from London. He doesn't go back to Yafo. He goes to Yerushalayim. This was engineered by his Talmidim, Rabbi Yaakov Moshe Chalab, Rabbi Tzip Pesach Frank. These young rabbis brought him back to the land and set him up as now the Rabbi Yerushalayim and eventually becomes the Moradar of Yisrael. But he's now a, a, a global leader. He's moved his embassy from Jaffa to Jerusalem. So I don't know if I answered the question, but I've tried to give some perspective on, on who Rav Cook is. Sure, let me, uh, thank you. And let me, let me move forward by uh, talking a little bit about uh, the Siddur as well and asking uh, anybody who tries to learn Rav Cook will know that the, uh, it's very, very difficult. Um, his uh, many, many of the Hebrew works are, are uh, are very, um, you know, very dense, very difficult, and his writing style is uh, very verbose and very wordy. Um, you've written the Rabbi Beryl Wine once quipped that why say in two words what you can say in twenty? Uh, was Rav Cook being deliberately obtuse, or was that his natural way of expressing himself? And related, and I and I want to add a. Uh, a, uh, a little section to that question regarding the Siddur itself, uh, because um, uh, this is, after all, a synagogue, and we hope that people will 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 take a Siddur and it'll enhance their their tefillot. The notion of a, a commentary on the Siddur is a shul in Teaneck that recently banned cell phones because we welcome distraction when it comes to davening. And uh, even Jews davening at Beis Medrash will pick up a Gomorrah rather than, than simply daven. Is there a danger that a commentary in the Siddur, uh, rather than enhancing the tefillah, on some level is a welcome distraction from a true engagement with tefillah? And how do you think Rav Cook would have, would have felt about that? And now I'm being um, a little provocative on the, uh, in the question, but uh, it seems to be an important question. Before we answer, there are chairs, there are actually some few chairs stacked there. If you have a uh, coat um, over a chair, let's make room for people. It's not, it's not necessary for people to be standing. Um, and um, there's chairs here at the front. And so do you mind just unpacking those chairs there so people can come and sit down? Sorry for the, uh, the interruption. And. Um, uh, Professor Shapiro. Okay, well, it's a very interesting question. I'll leave it for Rabbi Noor, the, um, the second part. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, the first commentary on the Sidur was actually by Rav Shimshon Raphael Hirsch. And he was mocked for this. Uh, he was mocked for his commentaries on Tehillim. Uh, in fact, they had an expression in Nicholsburg. They said that uh, before Rav Cook came, before Rav Hirsch came to uh, Nicholsburg, they would. Uh, learn Gemara and Zog Tehillim. And now when he comes, they, they Zog Gemara and they learn Tehillim. I mean, so the idea of actually uh, studying the Sidur is something we might take for granted, but it is a new concept and in line with Rav Cook's ideas that, uh, you know, the new is, is not necessarily bad. But uh, it is, his, his writings are very difficult. There's no question about it. Although I will say, and uh, I, I don't know, we have to see if Rabbi Noah, who's the real expert, uh, agrees with me. I think after he comes to Eretz Yisrael, it's more Kabbalistic and more poetic. Uh, in fact, he only wrote one work, although I haven't seen the brand new one that just appeared, uh, just appeared last week, which you got a special shipment. Uh, but other than Lin Volche Hador, none of his works are really written with the intention, his philosophical works, of being published in an organized fashion. So that really gets to the question, I think, a bit, that these writings were not really written in the sense to as a work to be published the way it is. He himself confessed that he is not good at that. He is, and he gave 
permission to his three uh, minders, as it were, his son, Rav Yaakov Moshe, Charlap, and the Nazir, to edit his writings. And he even allowed them on occasion, even though he says that you can't hold back the light, we know that on occasion he did allow them to change things. Uh, so when you're reading his writings, you're reading an effervescence that comes forward. You're not reading something thought out to be formulated. It's, it, it's almost prophetic in the way that the soul can't withhold the writing that comes out. So the question implies that, um, you know, did he purposely intend to formulate in this way? But he never intended to formulate it in any way. These writings, the, came out, and if you look at his writings, you'll see there are a few lines. I mean, everything he thought he writes, it's almost like Nietzsche's uh, aphorisms. I mean, he just, anything that comes out, it's coming out of his soul. So yes, it's, it's obscure, but not because he intended it to be. This arises from his soul, and this is pre-edited in a way. That's what I would, that's how I would answer the question. Wow. Th this is a, a huge discussion. Um, <sighs> Rav Kook is what we call in, in Hebrew nefesh piutit. He's, he's a poetic soul. His prose uh, reads like poetry. The irony is when Rav Kook actually uh, wrote poems, per se, um, they're not very poetic. <laughs> Uh, the, the language is very choppy. It's, it's almost monosyllabic. Um, so th there's a great irony there, and it's something to think about. Why, why this man who was uh, so poetic, when he actually writes a poem, it, it flops as a poem. Um, and they've set them to music, and you know, and people say to me, but you know, it just it doesn't really work as, as poetry. Uh, in Toronto, many years ago, now you know I'm a dinosaur, there was a great sage by the name of Marshall McLuhan. <laughs> and uh, the, the great uh, Torah that we have from Marshall McLuhan is, the medium is the message. And that definitely applies to Rav Cook. Um, many years ago, I had a meeting with uh, Rabbi Zalman Shachta Shalomi, and uh, he asked me, "What do you do?" I said, "I, you know, I have devoted my life to Rav Cook." And he said, "Ah, Rav Cook." He says, "He writes on a, a certain wavelength." And if you can tap into that wavelength, he's got you. So the, the medium of Rav Kook is very important. And I'm going to confess, when I was a, a bocher in, in yeshiva, uh, I, I, somehow I snuck some uh, contraband into the yeshiva. It's called the Rota Kodesh. Um, and, uh, I remember uh, I was very engrossed. I was uh, reading the Rota Kodesh, and I felt a, a presence over me. It wasn't Rav Cook; it was the Mashkiach <laughs> of the yeshiva. And I'm thinking this could be the end of your career, with Naor. At that time, my name was not Naor; it was Nair. Um, I looked up, and he looked down, and he never said a word. And he kept going. And I'm not going to reveal the man's name now, but uh, uh, <laughs> I didn't understand anything. I, I got high from reading Orota Kodesh. The language is just, uh, it, it's gorgeous. <coughs> and I was on a, on a roll. I was on a high. If you would ask me, what did I read? I, I didn't understand a, a darn thing. But I was just getting high from that. Line. So the, there is a, a wavelength of Rav Cook. Um, he's not uh, uh, being obtuse on purpose. Uh, in fact, he complains many times that he's not able to communicate. He, he feels he's, he's uh, handicapped. He's, he's uh, uh, a mute almost. Um, 
he did his best to communicate. Uh, Professor Shapiro is absolutely correct. There's a definite shift of consciousness. You see that. There's the, the writings that are pre-Aliyah. Rav Cook made Aliyah in 1904 to Yafo. Uh, there, you, you'll see a shift of consciousness which is expressed in the, the writing style. Uh, back in, in, uh, in Europe, in uh, Lithuania, his writing is uh, standard rabbinic writing. It's not uh, very different from that of the Chazonish, who also has a, a golden pen uh, in his letters. Um, he comes to Eretz Yisrael, and something happens to that man. Something happens inside his uh, kepala. And nefach uh, le'ishacher, he's another man, another style of writing, and it just flows and flows and flows. Um, some years ago, I, I met a, a Jew whose father had been in St. Gallen, Switzerland. Uh, in World War I, the, the year that Ruff Cook was there. And uh, at that time, Ruff Cook was relieved of all rabbinical duties. He was a refugee rabbi. He was hosted by Avram Kimchi, Yemen Kamach and Torah. And uh, he was free, probably for the, the one year of his life, to just write. And, and this man son uh, reported to me that Rav Cook was writing nonstop. Uh, Ramoshe Tsuriel speculates that Rav Cook had a magid, you know, the way the Ramchal could just write nonstop at a very fast pace. Uh, he, he had some kind of astral guide. Ramoshe Tsuriel believes that Rav Cook had a magid. I don't know. I wasn't there. Oh, let me just add, the Rav Soloveitchik, as far as I know, only quotes Rav Cook one time, and that's from the Sidor. But he also says that, uh, I think it's in the book, The Conversations, that it was published, uh, that he too finds Rav Cook very difficult to understand. And so if anyone else <laughs> finds it difficult to understand, you're in uh, good company. I, uh, I remember hearing many years ago from Rabbi Riskin that uh, he just said as an anecdote that uh, Rav Kook, and tell, correct me if, uh, if I understand this wrongly, uh, that uh, incorrectly, that uh, Rav Kook frequently after davening, or in the middle of davening, would take out a pen and start writing. That the ideas came to him in, uh, in, in tefillah, and uh, that he felt this connection, this outpouring of uh, divine influence, I guess. I think is most significant is that with all this stuff that we have, the writings, this is still only a very small element of who he was. For the most part, he was a traditional Rav, deciding halacha questions, leading a community, and uh, this wasn't his main thing. And almost, I mean, although in the academic world, we like to look towards him, study all these things. It almost reminds me how in the academic world, you know, they sometimes view Rav Soloveitchik as basically he had to make a living, so he's a Rosh Hashiva, but really his focus is on philosophy, and it was really the exact opposite. His main focus was on traditional Torah learning, and I think it's almost uh, with Rav Cook the same thing, that Rav Cook was a traditional Rav who, um, this was not his main pursuit, these uh, philosophical musings that you see, in his, even though he was constantly writing down his thoughts. In fact, there's been criticism of Rav Cook in the more Haredi world of the sort that uh, his problem was he wrote down everything he thought. Right. And that... Um, the other criticism, which I was told personally by uh, the son of Rav Yechesko Sarn, Rav Chaim Sarn, he was the Rosh Hashiva of Chevron, was that the real problem with Rav Kook is that you can go pages and pages and not see a reference to a quote of Chazal or anything. And he says, who ever heard of a great rabbi? Of course, if you read Rabbi Naor's edition of Arot, you see that everything he said is uh, based on Kabbalistic sources and rabbinic sources. But uh, I still, I'd be curious to know if you agree with this point, though, that you still have to regard him as a traditional Rav with traditional rabbinic focus before you get to these other areas, that that's not his main focus. Okay, I'm going to work backwards. <laughs> I remember many years ago I had this conversation with uh, my great teacher, Rav Shlomo Fisher. I, did you meet him eventually? Or? No, not yet. Okay. And um, he quoted Rav Cook as saying that everything that he writes can be sourced in Kitvei Harizal and the Lurianic writings, but 
Uh, Rav Shlomo Fischer questioned that. He was, uh, was tongue-in-cheek about that. Uh, Rav Cook uh, was, was begging people, honestly, to provide financial assistance to him so that he could be relieved of his rabbinical duties. This is back in Yafo. And just devote his time to writing full time. So that's really what he saw as, vo as his vocation was just to stream <laughs> these thoughts, get them down on paper as best he could. Um, that was Lechatchila. The amazing thing is that, uh, with the exception of that one year in St. Gallen, when that, that dream came true, Rav Cook was, uh, was overburdened with his rabbinical duties uh, in Yafo, but even more so in Yushalayim, when he became the, the chief rabbi, chief Ashkenazic rabbi, which meant that not only was he saddled with uh, rabbinic responsibilities, but he also had to constantly interface with the British government, and uh, that was a lot of responsibility. Um, you know what the issue is, is he a Talmudist and a Halachist first, and these other things are separate, or fundamentally is he a Kabbalist, a thinker, and although he does imply, he says that certain people with their souls soar and they have to be brought, when they're brought down to deal with the nitty-gritty of halacha, that's a bad thing. I mean, if that's the description of his own personality, then that would answer the question. But, do you, but is that just a, 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 a thought he had or is that fundamentally, was he not really a Talmudist and a halachist like you'd say Rav Solveitchik was? Yeah. Well, we don't know what Rav Soloveitchik is either. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, can, I, can't, I can't know what's in the neshama of another human. I can't even know what's inside my neshama, honestly. So I'm going to leave Rav Soloveitchik, who was another uh, great teacher of mine. I had this chut, uh, you know, I'm a New Englander. I spent a lot of time in Boston, but also in New York. But I don't want to go into, into the, the Rav now. Uh, I want to speak about this Rav. In fact, somebody said, how can you refer to Rav Cook as, as the Rav? Well, you know, the Rav is Rav Soloveitchik. Okay. I love everybody. The, uh, Rav Cook uh, was a tortured soul. Uh, halacha, restricting, confining himself, being mitzamsem, his consciousness, to the, the protim and dikdukim, the, the minutia, the, the, uh, the punctilia of halacha was very painful, Rav Kook. And that comes out in his, his writings and his poetry, especially there are many poems, which as I said are failed poems, but they get the, the message across that here's a fellow who left to his own resources, as you said, with sore into the ether, he's that kind of cosmic consciousness, to use uh, Buck's term, uh, really a dinosaur. Um, I haven't heard anyone use the term cosmic consciousness for, for very long. But that's what he is all about, Ruff Cook, and uh, he forces himself, he, he really, he puts himself in a vice to, to deal with halacha, but if you asked him essentially, who are you? I don't think that essentially he's the Ish Halacha, to use Rav, Rav Soloveitchik's term. Um, you know, and then Heschel has the Ish Hagada. Um, he, he does that. He does that because he has to do it, because he believes that uh, that's what a Jew has to do. Uh, on this plane of reality, but left to his resources, he would be osek benisterot, he would devote himself to, to Kabbalah. Uh, Rav Soloveitchik has a, uh, a mystical side to him. He has a Chabad, there is a, a very strong Chabad component in Rav Soloveitchik. Um, 
And I, I used to see it when he would pray, honestly. You know, besides the fact that he would, uh, he would verbalize, he would quote uh, Likute Teira of the Alta Rebbe and Tanya, but I, I actually I saw it in the, in the way he would pray. I saw the Chabad component in there. So, uh, look, all of these people are highly complex, you know. Uh, you, you don't want to be reductionist when it comes to Rav Soloveitchik. Or, uh, no, no, I, really, I wasn't being reductionist. I was just saying that I think it's a distortion when people, we don't want to focus on Rav Soloveitchik to see him as basically a philosopher with the Talmudic stuff, you know, as sort of on the side. But with Rav Cook, it raises the question, is the Haredi critique correct, that he really is not a follower of the Lithuanian rabbinic approach, that he, I mean, you could put him in Tversky's models of, you know, Talmudists and Kabbalists and Medha that he's in line with an Ibn Ezra, like a, who says that we wouldn't need to know Chosh and Mishpat if people were not injuring each other. Ibn Kaspi, who, uh, you know, why do I need to know details of halacha? I can ask the rabbi if a spoon, a milk spoon falls in the meat. I want to focus on philosophy. I mean, if we see Rav Cook along those lines, and I think the Haredi critique is correct that he is not following in the traditional rabbinic perspective that we think of in terms of Lithuanian rabbis. And it's, I mean, Rav Tzvi Yehuda, who knew his father better than anyone else, was determined when he created his yeshiva not to create it, I mean, when he, when he took over the yeshiva, not to have it function along the way his father anticipated it would. He basically created a Lithuanian-style yeshiva. So even Rav Tzvi Yehuda was cognizant of the problems in portraying his father in that way. I'm going to go back to the, the tzav, this command. You know, not that I have any great mavinus in what the tzav was, uh, um, but again, there's a, a bipolarity there. The, the, the tzav says to write reish milin. Reish, I, I never told reish milin is a wonderful work. I think your brother is working on reish milin. He has a brother who is a kabbalist in St. Louis. Uh, reish milin is. Uh, Rav Cook's original midrash on the otiot, on the letters of the Aleph Bet, Aleph Bet, Gimel Dalet, and he writes uh, a page or two about each letter. Um, and it's a little work. It was published in London in 1917. Uh, Rav Tzvi wasn't around. He would never have allowed that. Um, Rav Tzvi was was uh, his father's censor. There's a dream that Rav Tzviuda had, which he records in, in his uh, writings, where he dreams he's together with his father, and there's a lamp which is burning very brightly so that the people out in the street can see the, the light from this lamp. And in the dream, Rav Tzviuda says to his father, we have to put an ahil, we have to put a shade on the lamp, a, la a lampshade, so the people out in the street can't see the light. And the father in the dream says, nothing doing, let that light just shine out. So, the, you know, this is a very transparent kind of dream. We all get it, we know what that's about, where Rav Tzviuda is anxious, uh, fearful, what the people out in the street, uh, what the, uh, the sarnas and the chevron yeshiva are going to think. And the father says, just let that light shine to the world. He's, he's fearless. But uh, together with Reish Milin, which is a Kabbalistic work, and that's when Rev Halap writes that there must be a tsinor, there must be a pipeline from the Kodesh, the Bet Kodesh Kodeshim to London that allowed you to write this work, Reish Milin. And there was a Arov in London, a very uh, cantankerous personality, his name was Adler. Shmar Yemenash HaKoyen Adler, who fought with the whole world. He loved Rev Cook. He uh, was by the way. Yeah, uh, he was in prison for a while. He fought with the chief rabbi uh, Hertz that time, Joseph Hertz. He fought, but he loved Rav Cook for whatever reason. And uh, this uh, Adler, 
who was uh, Gaon, you know, he was in the league with Rev Cook and the Ragachov and all these people. He really was a very uh, talented uh, man. He wrote a commentary on Reshmi Lin that goes on for hundreds and hundreds of pages. Uh, I'd love to know what happened to it. But that, that's Reshmi Lin. It's a little, uh, a little sefer. And on that, Adler uh, evidently appreciated the, the depth, wrote a commentary that goes on for hundreds and hundreds of pages. But together with Reish Milin, there is the Halakha Brura. And what is Halakha Brura? This is, uh, <laughs> this is manual labor, where Rav Cook wrote on the, the page, on the daf of the Talmud, from memory, the references in Rambam, in Shulchan Aruch. I'm not talking about Ein uh, Mishpat Ner Mitzvah, which just gives you address. Rav Cook, from memory, actually wrote those passages in the Rambam Shulchan Aruch, so you would have it on the daf. And people tried to reason with Rav Cook, Rebbe, what are you doing? What are you doing with your time? This is ridiculous. You know, <laughs> with your mind, with your talent, with capability, this is what you're doing. And so he gave two answers. One was there are Jews that are working the fields, they're working hard in the fields. This is I'm the the uh, the counterpart. This is how I work hard in, in the field. The other answer was he said it's binyan ha Torah le This is Torah for the ages. So he is a, he is a halachist, he is an ish halacha, you know, he was a, uh, a world-class posek. Like we had here uh, on the Lower East Side, Ramosha Feinstein, who's answering uh, the, the questions, shyless from all over the world. Ruff Cook is also, he's, you know, from Argentina and, and from Europe, all over the world. People are addressing halachic queries to him, and he writes response, and Ruff Suda published that. In fact, he gave preference to that, to the halachic works, uh, the Shelotu Chuvot, before the Agadic works, because he wanted to establish his father's uh, bona fides and, and credibility as an Ish Halacha. If you ask me, who is Rav Kook? Essentially, he's not a halachist. That, that's bidyavad. L'chadchila, he's a fellow who wants to be osek benisterot. He wants to soar to the heights. Well, let, let me, you know, come in here and just and move the discussion on a little bit. It's fascinating, really genuinely fascinating. And, uh, you know, um, Rav Kook, and by the way, we have, and they're published and they're available, we have the chuvot, the halachic response of Rav, uh, of Rav Kook on, uh, and, um, Rabbi Rosenfeld is one of the most one of the most popular Torah classes, regular Torah classes in the shul and response to literature. We'll, uh, if you petition him, maybe he'll devote a few weeks to uh, some of the Chuvot of Rav Kook, which are um, um, important and they're very very important in their own right. Rav Kook at the same time occupied the office of chief rabbi, the first chief rabbi of the yeshuv, which is a Ashkenazi chief rabbi, which meant that he accepted upon himself the responsibility for shaping the institution of the chief rabbinate, now sadly a tarnished institution, but certainly his vision for it was anything but. And in many of his public proclamations, he took upon himself to be the Rav of the, 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 the Jews, the observant community of, 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 of the land of Israel and its famous Massah journey to the outlying Yishuvim with, uh, with representatives of the Haredi community. So um, the next question really is about where Rav Kook belonged or where he's accepted in various sectors. But just before we transition into that and to wrap up with a little bit more about the Sidur, uh, just again, in terms of your insistence, Rav Kook is fundamentally a mystic. What does a mystic want to be chief rabbi for? Wow. <laughs> is that to me? Or That's to, to you. Okay. <laughs> and then to rabbi, uh, Professor Shapiro. Yeah, all right. So as I said at the, at the onset, um, something happens to Rav Kook in World War I. Um, there are many things that, that come together to precipitate this. Um, 
There's the Balfour Declaration. Rav Cook was in London at the time of the Balfour Declaration, and he was behind the scenes working to make that happen. Um, so that's Hashkachar Pratik, that he was in the right place at the right time. That, you know, how he, from Yafo, ended up in London to be there at that critical moment of the, the Balfour Declaration. Um, so the, the Ottoman Empire collapses in World War I. Um, you have uh, Christian Zionists who are sympathetic to the cause, and um, it's a new ball game, you know. And Rav Cook is there, he steps up to the plate, and he assumes the responsibility to be the, the first Ashkenazic chief rabbi of the land. The Sfardim had, before they had the, under the Ottomans, they had the Chacham Bashi, but he's the first uh, true Ashkenazic chief rabbi. And, um, you know, I, I mentioned Christian Zionists, and I, if, I, if I could, I just, I have to say, so this is something very important. Um, as Professor Shapiro pointed out, the, the, the writings of Rav Cook were censored. Uh, they were suppressed for many years by his son, by Rav Tzviuda. He allowed some to trick aloud, and even that, sometimes he would patch it with the Lashaynas. Um, and now, a lot is coming out, and it's coming out so fast and, and so furious, it's hard for scholars such as us to, to keep up with it. There's the, uh, the Pinkase Raya, and this Kvatsi Mechtav Yad Kod Show, and now our friend uh, Matthew Miller of Koran Magid just published Mitziot Katan, which Rav Cook wrote, we figured out he was, what, about 20, 23 at the time. And uh, my friend, Rav David Stefanski, from time to time, he uh, communicates with, I think, WhatsApp. You know, the technology keeps changing. Uh, the, I think the latest is WhatsApp. <laughs> A and um, he's, he sends me a couple of things. One is where a fellow refers to Jews as Jesus haters. And uh, then another thing you sent me was this Pastor Haggy, who's a, I would call him a Christian Zionist. He's a Christian fundamentalist. And he says that uh, several weeks before I spoke to President Trump about moving the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And I wrote back, you know, this is my son, my Zeno or whatever. I'm not a Jesus hater. And I said, uh, I quoted Alamed Vovnik. There was a, an elderly Rav who uh, was in a nursing home and unfortunately had no wife, he had no children, and uh, I adopted him. Amazing man, I can't go into him, he was Alamed Vovnik, but, uh, but he, uh, Margala Bafume, he always used to tell me, you can never know what's in a Yiddish Abayach. You never know what's in a Jewish belly. That's the. That was his saying. So I said, yeah, the Chazal referred to Jesus as Poshe Yisrael. That's, you know, that's his uh, title. I said, but on the other hand, th there's a Gemara. There's a Gemara in, in the Perikanizo King, and the, the next uh, daf. And, and Dafnun Zayn Abed Aleph, where a reporter went into Gehinom and he interviewed two personalities in hell. One is Poshe Yisrael, in the censored version, and the other is Yeshua Hanotzri, Jesus. And the other, and the, the, the first one is he interviews is Bilam Harasha. Uh, and both of them are uh, burning in hell, and Bilam is in. Uh, 
is in Sheikh Vadzera, Rotachat, and Poshe Yisrael is in Tzawar, Rotachat. And he asks Bilam, uh, what do you think of the Jewish people? And Bilam says, the terrible people, you should have nothing to do with them, do no good, only bad to them. And Rashi points out, this is a man, this is a fan, this is a man who was a Navi, who was a prophet. God spoke to Bilam. And despite all of that, Bilam's advice to, to tells the reporter, have nothing to do with terrible people. Then he interviews Poshe Yisrael, Jesus. And what do you think of Jewish people? And Jesus is Meshabeach Am Yisrael. And the, the love of the Jewish people, he says, do only good to the Jewish people, never do bad to the Jewish people. So I said, the, the, the worst Jew, who's called in the rabbinic literature, Poshe Yisrael, can never know what's in a Yiddish boyach. Through him, the, the embassy <laughs> moves from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. This is a heretical thought. Now, our, Mr. Meshuggah, how crazy can you get? Of course, my friend, he, he sent me back, I think, a big heart. He loves it. Right before Shabbos, uh, Matthew Miller, FedEx to me, Metzios Katan. I opened up right before Shabbos, stayed up all night, Friday night, going through Metzios Katan. And I'm sorely disappointed. What's the big deal? Maharaj. For this, 15 scholars had to work for four years. I, a lot of the material Ripsfuda had teased out, some he put into the sea door, which I recognized immediately. Maharaj, what's the big deal? Then I come to one piece. I'll show it to you. Because uh, Professor Shapiro, through Svarnblog, he, he gives us such an education. Years ago, he put out from Sefer Likutim, Ramosha David Vale. A, a Kabbalist of the circle of Ramchal, Moshe Chaim Lutzato, these Paduan Kabbalists, who has a very nuanced uh, view of, of Yeshua HaNotzri. He refers to him as a Mamzer Talmid Chacham, who's Kodem Lekoen Gadol Am Haaretz. That's his epithet. Yeah, he's a Mamzer uh, Talmid Chacham. And he says more, which uh, Professor Shapiro can tell. So here, I, I went through the whole Sefer, 700 pages, come to one piece. What is the one piece? Rev Cook has a very nuanced perception of, of Otoha Ish, he calls him, that man. He doesn't say his name, that man. Yeshua Notsu, Jesus of Nazareth. And again, it's, it's a halachic perception. It's a very nuanced perception of Yeshua Notsri that there, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. There is something in there. Now, we're not Kabbalists, and you know, it, it, the, the language is of Kabbalah, it's, it's, a, it's a language, you have to learn the language. But he quotes the Gemara, he says that, that, uh, Yisrael, that he praised the Jewish people. And what he's all about is to teach the nations, the Sheva Mitzvot B'nai Noach, to teach the nations of the world the Seven Commandments, and that, that's what he's all about, and there is something messianic there. But again, don't go to church now. And, but, but I'll tell you one thing that comes out of it. In yeshivas, we have a term, pchaba, test. If you want to test who is a Christian who is really attuned to Otoa Ish, he would be what I would call a Christian Zionist. The, the fellow over in Rome, Devos Trokta Kapel, Afinkop, and meets with Erdogan of Turkey because they can't stand that Yerushalayim is declared the, the capital of Israel. He's not Mitomi De Yeshu. He's not listening to Jesus. Because Hagi is listening to Jesus, because whoever listens to Jesus, but Jesus says, I love the Jewish people, do only good for this people. 
I'm going to bring the subject back to Shul and uh, <laughs> away from the Vatican. Um, and, uh, and just um, really, because time is not on our side, and yeah. this has been really a, 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 a really stimulating uh, a morning, just to one final question about the Sidur. Um, what do you hope is going to you know, come out of the Siddur, about people learning the Siddur, davening from the Siddur, using the Siddur. Um, and what is your, and I ask both of you the question, what is your favorite uh, or a, a comment, uh, one of the insights of Rav Kook that printed in the Siddur that stands out, that help, that you feel illuminates, that uh, is particularly worthy of, uh, of our attention? Uh, last question, just to wrap up the two of you, Rabbi, uh, Professor Shapiro. Okay. Uh well, I, I, I marked a number of them, but if I had to give uh, my really an interpretation that I think should go with us, and it's actually not from um, Rav Cook, it's from his son, Rav Tzvi Huda. If you read the Sidur here, you see it's really, uh, it's the circle of Rav Cook. That's a phrase that's been used a lot. I think you even refer to it in the Sidur, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not sure. But Dov Schwartz and others now speak in terms of the circle of Rav Cook. So it's Rav Cook, it's uh, Rav Harlap, it's uh, the Nazir, it's the son, it's others. So you'll find in the Sidur interpretations as well as Rabbi Naor, who's also, I guess, part of the circle, because it is true, he's the, the leading expositor of Rav Cook in English. Um, so you'll have many of his own interpretations. But on page, um, I just mark this on page 62, and then it continues to page 65. Something very interesting and, um, I guess, paradoxical even. Um, the question he deals with is that uh, the, the term for martyrdom, Kiddush Hashem, sanctification of uh, God's name. Um, sometimes people, Chil Hashem, Kiddush Hashem, they, they don't realize that the word Hashem there is not God. It's not uh, desecrating God or sanctifying God. It's actually the name. You'll know that, uh, I mean, you'll see sometimes the way they transliterate it in English that they get it wrong. But um, I mean, it's, as he, the question is why it's such a strange term, uh, Kiddush Hashem, <coughs> for martyrdom. And then, um, I mean, you think it's just the opposite, as, uh, as Rabbi Noah writes. If anything, this would appear to be a desecration of the name because uh, you're being killed, you know, inappropriately. Uh, you're being martyred. That, doesn't that desecrate God's name? And he quotes uh, Rav Tzvi Yehuda, who says that, it, it quotes the Yerushalmi that says that Gadol Kiddush Hashem Echil Hashem. It says that uh, Kiddush Hashem is great in the Chil Hashem. And again, this is a great, uh, a strange passage because uh, obviously Kiddush Hashem is greater than the Chil Hashem. What's the, why do you need to tell us that? Uh, we all know that Chil Hashem is terrible. So, I mean, I mean, it's a very strange passage. And what does Rav Tzvi Yehuda say? Great is the sanctification precisely when it proceeds from desecration. Um, and as Rabbi Noah explains and points out that uh, th this is the, really the paradox. Martyrdom is at the same time, it's a desecration of God's name because here we're supposed to be worshiping God and uh, you know, we're being destroyed for that. But on the other hand, through that you have a, uh, a great uh, sanctification of God's name. So even in this most important thing of Kiddush Hashem, you find as well the Chilu Hashem, that you don't get to the Kiddush Hashem without going through the Chilu Hashem, and that message can be applied to many other areas. And fundamentally, although you don't mention this, I mean, that, when you looked around, uh, this, the, the beginning, the, it just gets back to my first comment, and I'll end with this. You had all these irreligious people coming, and everyone else looked and said, this is Chilu Hashem, they're coming to the land of Israel, which is supposed to sh spit out all these heretics and sinners. And they're coming, and yet they're coming to the land of Israel. What is more of a Chil Hashem than to bring their heresy from Vilna and Warsaw to the land of Israel? And Rav Kook saw the shell, the Chil Hashem, but inside the Kiddush Hashem, that they, Dafka, are going to teach us, the pious Jews, as it were, what it is that we're missing and we're going to give to them. And out of that's going to come the new Eretz Yisrael Jew. But the Kiddush Hashem comes out of the Chil Hashem. So that is a passage that I'll take with me. Oh, but no, your, your, uh, your passage and what you hope people are going to get from this tremendous work that you have, uh, that you have brought us? Well, obviously it, it should enhance the, uh, the tefillot, as you said, at Rabbi Robinson at the beginning. Um, the, the ability to, to pray. Um, would it be a distraction? You're afraid that people are going to be looking down at, at the, the, the commentary instead of actually praying. 
Uh, you know, uh, there was a great uh, Hasidic rabbi in Lublin. His name was Reb Leibla Eger. And uh, he was a grandson of Rabbi Kiva Eger. And, and, uh, he took a wrong turn, and he ended up in uh, <laughs> in Ishbitz, Ish at the Ishbitz Rebbe. And uh, he was notorious for uh, uh, he, he didn't adhere to the times. <laughs> Things happened late. If it was a bris, it was uh, very late in the day, or whatever. And uh, he was criticized, and his friend Reb Tzadok tried to defend him. But uh, the, the halachas at the time uh, were, were very critical of Reb Leibel Eger. And uh, his response was that, um, you know, when somebody is a, a craftsman, and uh, they have to sharpen their tools, whatever the, the, the craft is, uh, according to halacha, that, that's part of the package, you know, we could say Morty here, the videographer, uh, Morty Gilden. So, you know, whatever he has to do to set up, to make this, that's also, that's part of the uh, equation. And that was his response. So, um, this is probably not the answer you wanted to hear, but uh, yeah, if, pe if people, uh, they're going to take a little time out and, and refresh their, their their souls and, and come back with more answers. That's, that's part of the uh, ensemble. Let me, uh, let me wrap up by uh, the following observation on my part. If, if no, nobody's asking me any questions, but I would, uh, an to answer the question that I posed myself, it's a favorite inside of the, of the Siddur, and I'm, I'm grateful for my copy of the Siddur. I haven't had a chance to properly uh, learn through it, but uh, many, many years ago, driving around and actually in the east of England, listening to Rabbi Fran Tape, um, before Yom Imno Ra'im, quoted Rav Kook's uh, beautiful insight on the Yom Kippur uh, Machzer, that a person should never say that I was born in the wrong era, that I was born too early, too late. The person is alive right now because of the task that we, uh, that we have to do. And uh, to me this morning represents a, uh, a dialogue between uh, two uh, scholars of such phenomenal depth and, and breadth of knowledge and learning. It's been a privilege to sit next to them to understand that we really are. We sometimes think of ourselves as a, an orphan generation in terms of where's the creativity of our Jewish life. We sometimes really feel a, uh, and we're told to feel that everything is stagnant and the creativity has gone out of, uh, of, of Judaism. And uh, this publication uh, that uh, the new Rav Kook Sidur that will help breathe so much life and bring so much of those esoteric and refined ideas that we heard so much uh, somewhat in our grasp and to enhance our tefillah and to be able to spend time understanding or to hear this uh, scintillating dialogue between uh, two such incredible scholars uh, should really tell us that it's a privilege to be alive and to be able to uh, partake of the opportunities that this moment of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Jewish life gives us. So please join me in thanking. Let me just say, before I go, let me just say one thing that applies to Rabbi Naor's edition, one of maybe Rav Cook's most famous expression. He has a number of expressions about avat chinam, sinam, but maybe the most famous one is that the old will be renewed and the new will be sanctified. So I think when you see in the Siddur, I mean, you see the old, the, the writings, the Siddur, the prayers are old, but when you read the Siddur, I really think it's Yitzchadesh, it's really they are renewed. And uh, so I personally want to thank you, as well as all of Kal Yisrael, for what you've done. Sure, and uh, the speakers will be around for a few minutes afterwards to entertain any private questions. We're not going to open it up now for a Q&A, but... Uh and the books, of course, are for sale, everybody, and they will sell out, so uh, make sure to, uh, to jump online. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming, and thank you tremendously to our speakers. Oh, yeah.